Hello, good morning. I'm Ashok Rokade, consultant rhinologist and Andreas Kalbe, surgeon from Winchester and the University Hospital Southampton, UK. I welcome colleagues from around the world on behalf of our organizing team to this inaugural Winter Global Rhinology Endoscopic Sinus and Andreas Kalbe Surgery Webathon. Global Rhinology Network is a registered non-profit organization with a mission to foster surgical education in rhinology and skull base surgery. We have successfully hosted annual multi-center live surgical webcast, The Lioness, since 2014 in collaboration with Lion Foundation. Thousands of surgeons from all corners of the world have benefited from it. More than 2,000 surgeons from 110 countries have registered for GRACE 2020. We will have hugely informative and engaging sessions presented by eminent rhinologists and skull base surgeons from around the world. GRACE 2020 is hosted at the Global Telemedicine Studio of Professor Wilco Gronman in Utrecht in Netherlands. It is supported by Medtronic and Carl Stores. Thank you. Imagine, what if you could do even more to bring relief to your chronic rhinosinusitis patients with technology customized to your unique clinical and facility needs? Introducing Stealth Station Flex ENT Navigation System, a customizable system from Medtronic ENT, a market leader in image-guided surgery technology, featuring six hardware configurations, an optional portable card, two different electromagnetic emitter options, with flexibility in hardware design and optional software functionality, Get everything you need and nothing you don't with Stealth Station Flex ENT. Let's flex forward. Contact your Medtronic representative to customize a navigation solution that's right for you. Uh, Professor Harvey, Richard, I don't think everyone knows, uh, I think, Professor Harvey. He does need my introduction. Uh, we know that he's uh, one of the 
most important rhinology and skull-based surgeons in the world. He has done extensive work, uh, work in a variety of subjects. Personally, I've been quoting his work in, uh, um, in, uh, in, in a number of studies, the uh, lateral extent of the draft three, the study on uh, how to um, maximize the access of local uh, irrigation in the frontal sense. I think there is not a part of rhinology that he hasn't touched. Uh, so, uh, like everyone, will be hung into his words to see what he will be um, uh, talking about. <laughs> Richard, welcome. Thank you, Christos. It's a very kind introduction. Um, you know, today I've been given the task of talking about severe recurrent nasal polyposis. And, you know, I, I, I was quite happy to take this, this project on because, for me, this is as much about understanding the philosophy of what we're doing. Let me uh, move my slides on here. So the first thing is that when I was a student and, a, and an ENT registrar, I read books where these were the patients that I was told needed sinus surgery and that we would commonly see in, in our practice. Uh, the reality is that these are, are patients who have very discrete focal anatomical issues with very isolated sinus disease. And to me, this is never a patient our profession has struggled with. You know, we know how to treat these patients. So this is not what we see on a regular basis. You know, what we really see is this patient, patients who come to us with patchy diffuse changes. It's not really restricted to an anatomical functional unit as we understand it. And yet they're complaining of symptoms and yet somehow the same philosophy of surgery that was taught to treat those other patients was given to this patient. But surely this patient is some sort of inflammatory patient if they're not someone with just a whole lot of osteal occlusions. And I think this is something that's still lost in our profession a little bit. So when someone presents to me like this, I really don't see this patient as having anything to do with ventilation, plumbing, it's not trap mucus, it's not a simple thing that's gonna be sorted out for our patients. But it's very important because when we look at this patient here, you have to understand like many of the surgical interventions we discuss for these patients still somehow hark back to simple ventilatory surgery. Now, we've done a lot of research on these patients. There are new biologic agents coming out, a whole range of other treatments. And maybe like the Galen group here, we can maybe dumb it down and say that these groups are really type two and non-type two. This is what was sort of decided as, a, as the sort of broad phenotypes that we're dealing with. But, but there's a big issue here in our profession in the fact that we've done all this research, we understand this type two type inflammatory disorder. And yet, unfortunately, I still hear people talking about, uh, it's good to open up that sinus and ventilate it. I, I really think that if we're talking in those terms, we really are gonna lead to failure of management of these patients. And this is why so many patients and other medical professionals see sinus surgery as a low value intervention because there's not an acknowledgement of what's going on there. But if we acknowledge that for these patients, they have an inflammatory reaction, that mucus is getting trapped, and we can use surgery as a tool to break this process, then this is likely to lead us to success. And, and you know, this in my mind is where research and modern medicines and what is happening with clinical practice are diverging. And on this is where we're actually applying what we know about the disease to actual clinical practice. And this is where you'll have success. Now I showed this slide, this exact slide, about four years ago when I was giving a debate. And you know, and in that four years, we've had biologics come along and all sorts of other treatments for inflammatory disorders. And I think it's never so true now, this, this slide than before. Now, so of course, we do see people who have simple ventilatory problems, but down this end, and we apply simple treatments, I should say, for, the, for those simple blockages, 
but down the nasal polypens where patients have an inflammatory disorder. This is very different. What we do surgically is very different. And I try to make sure what we're trying to achieve with it. You know, what's the pathophysiologic process and how is my surgery going to break it? I think this is a fundamental question we have to ask ourselves. I don't do limited surgery. So gone are the days where we simply just do a polypectomy and maybe just open up the antrum and that call it, call it an operation for someone with severe polyps. And I certainly don't necessarily do extended sinus procedures when someone has very focal or limited disease. I really try to make sure that what I'm doing has a very set goal. And I'm going to take you through today what it is that I do in, in my practice that I feel helps me break patients who have severe nasal recurrent polyposis. So let's discuss upper airway inflammation. This person here is essentially who we're discussing. Now, I can't say it enough, right? It, even our allergy colleagues understand this, right? They even, this is a Larry Borish paper. Sinus osteal occlusion is no longer considered an important component of eosinophilic CRS. So if any part of your surgery talks about ventilation or, or ventilating a sinus, I really think one we're, we're abstracting ourselves from really what is known about the disease process and what we're doing as surgeons. And so, and so it's so important now in 2020 to ask ourselves this question. So why are we operating on this patient? Do we do a polypectomy? What is that going to achieve for the patient? And if we're not going to do a polypectomy, what advantage is it in doing anything more? And I'm going to try to really, be controversial here and say that if you want to do a polypectomy, I think that's fair enough. That would be a very limited intervention. If someone's got slow active disease, fair enough. But if you touch the sinuses in someone with nasal polyps, I think one has to have a very definite game plan as to why are you operating in the sinus cavity. So for the inflammatory patient, if you said to me, why do I operate in the patient? Mainly to allow topical therapy because our topical therapies simply do not get into the sinus cavity. It does overcome mucostasis. So many of these patients get chronic mucostasis. It's this acquired muc mucociliary dysfunction and it overcomes it with topical therapy. You do get rid of the secondary obstructive phenomenon. So pressure and barotrauma and things that patients get from having all that inflammation gets relieved, but it doesn't actually change the pathophysiology. And probably there's some element of reducing the inflammatory load when we remove the diseased tissue. But where does our anti-inflammatory therapy need to go? We are not treating the nasal cavity. It's still amazing the number of patients I see given simple sprays to treat extensive sinus disease, which exists here. Now that's fine if you have a rhinitis condition to use simple nasal treatments, but we really want to get the medicine into the sinuses. Whether you're using a prednisone or a corticosteroid systemically or biologic, you're getting it in there systemically, and that's an acknowledgement. And this is why so many eosinophilic or type two inflammatory patients feel so much better when they're given medication. But if you're gonna to try to deliver it locally, you really need to create a sinus cavity along the principles of what we discussed, and then deliver that topical therapy in a way that's actually gonna get in there. Now, we published this randomized control trial because this is a big question. Does the method of topical corticosteroid delivery impact the outcomes from CRS? So we did a randomized trial where we looked at simply sprays and irrigations and showed that in a randomized trial in post-surgical patients, control of the disease was better and superior with a nasal irrigation than a simple spray. There are three issues. I think when you come to operate for severe recurrent nasal polyposis is an issue about poor access for topical therapies. Something because many of these patients have inflammation for a long period of time and mucus doesn't clear and I'll touch on what we do there and mucus plugging, just like we see it in asthmatic patients who get plugging in their bronchi. We see it in the sinuses as well. And let me explain. Now, a big question comes in, what is the extent of surgery for someone like this? This person has classic ECRS, adult onset asthma. And one might often ask, you know, what type of surgery are we going to do for that, that patient? When we look at the scan pre-op, 
if I'm going to do an operation for these patients, I want to create a simple sinus cavity, which the goal is simply to achieve those endpoints I discussed before. And I do think if you're going to do this, although you can do it with simple draft 2A surgery, very commonly just simply widely opening the funnel allows you to access the upper ethmoid and frontal properly. We describe a technique called Carolyn's window or draft three. Either of these techniques will give you access to the funnel and, and, the, and the upper part of the ethmoid. Now, why do we say that? Well, over many years, all rhinologists have these patients. Here's one year out. You think you've done a wonderful job with your draft 2A and a full house fest. But then look what it looks like 24 months out with a patient who's very compliant with the corticosteroid irrigation. All of a sudden, they've got some edema now. They had a tiny little bit at, at year one. You might say there's a bit of, there's a bit of narrowing on some scarring. But by, by five years out, you can see here that there's edema in the frontal sinus and also in the upper part of the ethmoid. If you look at this scan for this person, this is what the scan looks like. Their inflammatory process is really coming back just in the frontal and upper ethmoid. Now, I don't think that that is an immunologically unique area for this patient to recur. I don't think the disease just happens to be more active there. I think what's happening here is that simply the patient's corticosteroid irrigations are not getting up to that area and they're getting eventually an eosinophilic reaction and mucus plugging. This is a, an MRI from a colleague of mine whom he started on a corticosteroid irrigation who'd had very limited sinus surgery. And you can almost make out the zone which has been opened surgically on how quickly it resolved and the zone above it that isn't exposed to topical therapies that they haven't had control of their disease. So when we do an operation now, this is the sort of cavity that we would typically do first go up front for someone with severe nasal polyposis and adult onset asthma. We sometimes would even trim the middle turbinates at the level of the uh, sort of orbital floor or the horizontal lamella, lamella. And the goal is simply to give this patient a simple cavity they can irrigate and manage and avoid the problems we discussed. What, why do we say that we see it in clinical practice? Christos was very kind and quoted this paper. This was a study that Henry Byram did a number of years ago, where we looked at frontal sinus surgery in the access of nasal irrigation. We looked at different surgical states and we compared a draft 2A versus a 3, and we looked at volume of irrigation and head position in a cadaveric study. And we just asked ourselves, do you make a bigger opening? Does that really increase topical therapies? It was a cadaver study and we put a camera into the frontal sinus and we looked then at a draft 2A and we compared it with both a horizontal um, as in a Frankfurt plane with a head in neutral versus vertex down and two different types of irrigations. And there's Henry showing how he's done the irrigation in Frankfurt and vertex down. And we did it with a small and large irrigation bottle and we compared it to a draft three. And we scored the amount of irrigation as it went into the sinus, whether it was just a simple distribution, medial half, lateral half, or a full lavage. And this is the sort of videos. This is someone who's had a draft 2A and looking in their frontal sinus, you can see here, there's almost no irrigation actually enters the frontal sinus at all with an irrigation bottle. Let's have a look at some other examples then. Here's someone who's had a draft three with the irrigation. Look at the difference in someone who's had then their whole area widely opened. You can actually make an enormous difference in topical therapies. And sure enough, the number of people, even in a vertex head down position, had actually limited lavaging, whereas in draft three, really 87.5% had a full lavage with a little bit of vertex down. And, and really the size of your opening overcame any sort of volume of distribution or head positioning. So just simply making anatomically good access was really what produced the results for us. 
Now, let's move on then to mucus plugging. So it's not just about simply setting someone up for topical therapy. One of the problems that we see is mucus plugging. You see it in the lower airway. So here's one of our patients. And you'll see these when you start to do big sinus surgery and treat these patients differently. Look at this person, completely great frontal. But look here on this side. There is an eosinophilic mucin plug in that left maxillary sinus. And just the same way that some severe asthmatics get a mucus plug in their segmental bronchi, we do see it as well in the sinus cavities. Now, that was an obvious case because you could see it in an open sinus cavity. Here's a patient who was sent to me. They've had pretty good looking surgery, right? Look at this side though. This side here, if you have a look, I'm gonna play it one more time. If you have a look here, this is their full house fess. And then when you go to the other side, you really can't see anything. And I think we probably see a lot of patients like this. And unfortunately that patient there, all they had was a frontal sinus and an upper ethmoid completely impacted with mucus. And because they weren't, didn't have an anatomical shape to their sinus cavity that allowed them to irrigate it, they really were in trouble and they just essentially plugged up their sinus cavity with mucin. So mucus plugging is a real problem that we see. And if you see patients like this, in which they have this, and you think that you, they've done a great job, but when they get to this point here and they have a sinus cavity that looks like this, it's very likely that all that's happened here is you've just got a complete mucus plug now of what was a, a, a type of sinus cavity for this person that was never gonna cut the mustard in terms of allowing mucus secretions to avoid getting plugging. Now, the third one I'm gonna talk about in my last few minutes here is mucus sumping. So once you open sinus cavities up, it's actually very important that they actually function normally. Now, when we use an irrigation, we actually overcome mucostasis. So all patients, when they have terrible inflammation, their cilia won't be working. They've often been in that state for years. And it's a remarkable on how well the system actually does recover. But for many patients, the mucus clearance mechanisms have not completely returned after sinus surgery. And this person's a good example. This person's had, for the, his disease, he's had a full house first and draft two A's. It's actually worked reasonably well for him. But if you look here, he's just getting mucus sumping in his left maxillary sinus. There's no dental disease here. And he just gets a bad smell and mucus sitting in his sinus cavity. He doesn't have an immunodeficiency or some other problem with infection. He doesn't have infection anywhere else in his body. The reason his left maxillary sinus is involved is he has a very small antrostomy. The surgeon opened it up to the maximum limits of what we describe as simple antrostomy between the orbital floor and the inferior and, and the inferior turbinate, but he's got a very big maxillary sinus. And when he does an irrigation, it, it simply doesn't remove the mucus from the maxillary sinus. And therefore on the left-hand side here, as you can see on the right endoscopic image, he just collects mucus and it just gets infected. And so we intentionally now do surgery to simply change the shape of the sinus to prevent that mucus plugging. This is an old video and I, I've, I've in this video, I've essentially just opened the floor up, but I actually now obliterate the floor and we might see a video here in a moment of how we do that. But at least for him back many years ago, this was enough to solve his problem. And now we do a style of surgery where we really try to raise the floor of the maxillary sinus so we don't even have a pit or a sump at the bottom um, of our medial maxillectomies when we do it, really trying to prevent the concept of mucostasis. Why do we do that? Because once again, we've done another study that was published by Ritter Sansoni, where they looked at what irrigation gets through an uncinectomy. Very, very little, tiny amount of irrigation gets through an uncinectomy. This is a camera sitting in the maxillary sinus. It's a little bit better when you actually 
do an proper androstomy. And you might say that's pretty good compared to the frontal one I showed you. And I agree. That's why I don't necessarily do a medial maxillectomy on everyone. I only do it in select patients, but you can see that even an androstomy does a pretty good job compared to frontal draft 2A. And then after you then do a modified medial maxillectomy, sorry for the... slides and here we go so here's a modified medial maxillectomy in which once you remove part of the medial wall of the maxillary sinus you really do get a, a completely different irrigation very forceful it's like a proper lavage and that's what helps to overcome the mucostasis that occurs in many of these patients so we now have a different way of thinking about sinus disease in my last five minutes. EPOS 2012 or 2020, I should say, has proposed that we really move away from polyps, non-polyps. And we talk about three layers of describing sinus disease, whether it's primary or secondary. Primary or secondary means it's just simply just a sinus or an airway disorder, respiratory disorder. It's not part of an immunodeficiency or some genetic condition. So if it's just a respiratory condition, it's not Schurg-Strauss or eosinophilic angitis, we, we essentially refer to that then as a primary CRS. It's either localized or diffuse, meaning it restricts itself to an anatomical area or it's patchy. And then it's type two and non-type two, and that's it. And in, in that though, really lies all the descriptions of phenotypes that we know to be true. So AFRS is a good example of something that can be restricted to one anatomical space, but still is associated with a type two inflammatory disorder. We have a non-type two. This is our classic isolated sinusitis. And all of these patients here are good examples of just a simple osteal occlusion disease. You know, we've got that one sorted for most of the, most of the part, but it is the diffuse group the diffuse type two group in which we consider the severe recurrent nasal polyposis. We have CCAD, which are these patients who have allergic changes on their septum and turbinates, which are really is just an exuberant allergic rhinitis. It's really an inhaler and allergy issue. And these patients need immunotherapy in terms of classic allergen immunotherapy. We have ECRS, which is the patients that I'm really talking about today. And then I think we include AFRS in this because you see AFRS where one, one functional unit gets slowly compresses and involves another, and they can often present with diffuse disease. There is, of course, <clears throat> a diffuse group that is not eosinophilic, and this is also exists in the lower airway, but it's a, it's a tricky group. We're yet to really describe this group. It's the sort of macrolide responder, the poor corticosteroid responder, maybe the older patient, the smoker, someone who's obese. This is still something that we're trying to sort out. And they might look like this. They may still have polyps, but they don't have eosinophilic mucin. They just have the sort of a milky secretions as we often see. Now, this is EPOS. And that's their characterization of, of these conditions with, of course, the severe polyps being a primary diffuse type two disorder. So for the primary diffuse patient, once again, I do surgery to allow topical therapy to overcome mucus stasis or mucus plugging. I don't want patients to get pressure problems when they fly or, or, or from having uh, trapping and, and it does reduce inflammatory load. And I love this, this, this image by Sally Wenzel. And this is from another talk, but really talks about the sort of polypoid conditions we see, you know, we have this sort of allergic CCAD, ESRS, and even a non-ESRS. And if you ask me, what, what treatments do I apply? Well, if you have an allergic polypoid condition or CCAD, you know, although I operate on these patients, I won't often do a draft three, but I'll just create a simple sinus cavity for them. I, I really aggressively manage their allergy that you can't just simply use a bit of Nasonex to suppress this away. You've got to treat their underlying allergy properly. ECRS is the group in which we use biologics and corticosteroid irrigations. I think everyone's happy to uh, sort of identify that subgroup. And then really the non-ECRS patients who, who even have polypoid changes but lack eosinophilia, this is probably the target group for macrolides. It's been a bit elusive, I think. You know, we see fabulous macrolide responders, but we've done research here 
to sort of suggest that this is probably where you're going to invest your your time in investigating the effects of macrolides in the immunomodulation. So in conclusion here, it's time to acknowledge the pathoetiology and change our surgery. It's, it's not all or even primary infective for most patients. It's not an obstructive disease and ventilation plays little role for most primary diffuse CRS subtypes, but it's amazing how so many people don't operate accordingly. And I really think it's time to manage it differently. There's no more discussion about surgery as an isolated intervention. You do surgery, what's the success of surgery? The surgery is there to facilitate a treatment paradigm or a treatment strategy. And, and I still think, you know, when we talk about historical articles discussing surgery, often the maintenance of these patients is not included. And, and really we have to discuss the anti-inflammatory maintenance that goes on with these patients because it's not a ventilation or a plumbing problem. And, and we need to discuss more about this idea of overcoming or restoring the mucociliary dysfunctional state that produces those mucostasis situations that I spoke about, because they can often occur after otherwise well-performed surgery and well-performed anti-inflammatory therapy. You just have patients who aren't clearing mucus. It's one, something we see in fungal ball a lot of. People have fungal balls often have this mucociliary dysfunction. We're not sure whether it's chicken and egg there, but it's just very common in fungal ball. And that's another sort of area in which we see that mucostasis. And, and so really, I think the time has come now to ask, you know, what is the goal of the surgery? And, and I think uh, we have to move on from this idea of discussing uh, surgery as being a, uh, uh, a ventilation or opening up or aerating the sinuses. That's not what we're doing. And if it's not what we're doing, then it should change the way we think about what the surgical techniques we are. And that's why so many rhinologists now perform a very simple neosinus cavity when they manage these patients. First up early on to sort of set them up for long-term local anti-inflammatory care. Now in my one 60 seconds, I'm going to say, Ashok, someone asked me the other day with biologics coming out, you know, it, it, is, it, is the time for the surgeon gone in nasal polyposis? I would say the absolute opposite. If you are a revision surgeon now, it is the best time ever in our profession to, to be a revision sinus surgeon. Because the one thing that we always struggled managing, like asthma specialists, not everyone gets control with local therapies. And so we now have the tools to control the inflammatory process and, and simply taking a biologic doesn't make someone's sinuses normal. And for all the reasons that I discussed about mucus stasis and mucus plugging and the secondary things that they create, they all occur in patients who go on to biologics. And unless you fix all of that by creating a simple sinus cavity and getting patients on a regime where they can manage all of those other issues, the biologic's not the answer either. And so it's not like we're gonna be replaced, but the biologic helps to, to treat a group of patients in which we inherently always had a limited option for. So thank you very much for listening to my, my talk and uh, happy to take any questions.
Thank you very much, Richard. That was a great talk, as always. And um, really, I find it always your talks very interesting because they, they don't go from one side. You try to cover different sides of the problem. And um, it seems like we will have to think um, laterally, to think more, uh, let's say, more um, intelligently if we want to understand and treat the patients with nasal polyps. Now, there is a, a question from the audience from um, how do you deliver medication with irrigation? As far as I know, the only irrigation available to me in the UK is saline. Uh, yes, well, sir. I suppose, yes, so there's saline, but yeah. Yeah, so there's lots of additives you can add. We normally use a saline or an isotonic base, but we add everything from mimetazine to betamethazine to budesonide into irrigations. And that's how we deliver that agent. And so, and so the drug is used and the, and the irrigation is just the carrier for it. Yes. Suppose and and if you said to me, Christos, one of the questions, people say, why is there not a commercially available product? Why, is the, why has someone not come out with a, a mimetazone uh, irrigation, you know, as a commercial product? Companies know that the market's there, but it's not patentable. It's not a patentable issue. It's simply just a delivery issue. And if they can't protect their investment through a patent, they're not interested. This would be a very common thing. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. And um, I don't think there are any other questions. So thank you very much, Richard. That was great. Thank you, Richard. I mean, really appreciate it because uh, it's nearly midnight. And uh, yes, you have uh, offered to do this talk at this time. It's re really, really uh, thankful for that. Yeah, it's very problem, useful, yeah. uh, especially for us who deal with this uh, area of you know, revision surgeries. Yeah, no worries. And it, my only passing words is that, please, as surgeons, if you just say, I don't like to do that first up, I like to do this first up because of some sort of comfort zone. It, it is, uh, some people say to me, I don't like to do the frontals first up. I don't like to, only only like to do a draft two first up. I think they are the sort of statements that I think my talk is aiming to help us break. To say, you know, what is it that we're really trying to achieve for our patients and, and consider doing that intervention as your surgical intervention when you invest the time in modifying their sinuses. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. The head and neck surgeries you perform are vital. Your patients place their trust in you. You help them continue to speak and smile, eat and drink, hear and comfort. You're committed to helping them continue to live fully, to feel deeply, and to enjoy the quality of life they've come to expect. That means being confident that you're protecting and preserving your patient's head and neck nerve function during procedures. Introducing NIM Vital, the next generation of nerve monitoring technology. NIM Vital provides advanced nerve monitoring that helps you reduce the risk of nerve damage during head and neck procedures. Detailed intraoperative nerve condition information helps inspire your surgical strategy. An intuitive user interface with a wire-free patient interface allows for easy setup and enhanced visualization from the surgical field. Real-time notifications of nerve conditions, visually and audibly. Green, yellow, and red status bars provide visual information, and their associated tones provide audible cues, making monitoring function easier than ever. NIM Nerve Trend EMG reporting enables nerve condition tracking throughout a procedure, even when using intermittent nerve monitoring. And when paired with a NIM continuous monitoring electrode, you have continuous nerve monitoring informing your surgical strategy. NIM Vital pushes the boundaries of monitoring nerve function in various procedures in head and neck surgery. With real-time information available during surgery, giving you confidence in nerve function. Because protecting patients' nerves and senses is more than vital. NIM Vital.
Imagine, what if you could do even more to bring relief to your chronic rhinosinusitis patients? With technology customized to your unique clinical and facility needs. Introducing Stealth Station Flex ENT Navigation System. A customizable system from Medtronic ENT, a market leader in image-guided surgery technology. Featuring six hardware configurations, an optional portable card, two different electromagnetic emitter options, with flexibility in hardware design and optional software functionality. Get everything you need and nothing you don't with Stealth Station Flex ENT. Let's flex forward. Contact your Medtronic representative to customize a navigation solution that's right for you.